we can change our beliefs around what we are worth, if we can change our own money story and the value that we can bring, and we understand the law of compensation, now we have a phenomenal methodology for doubling, tripling, quintupling income. John, thanks for coming on the show. Really excited to have you here. Great to be on with you. Yeah, I'm excited to dig in. Obviously, we were just talking about Montreal and how we both have a history there. Obviously, you were there uh, for for probably longer than I have, and you still have a lot of family there. And for me, Montreal has been an area of my life where it's really fundamentally changed the way I looked at uh, my potential. I looked at the way I've surrounded myself with different friend groups. It's really been a pivotal point in my life um, just to kind of unlock the, the, the connection we have with Montreal. For you particularly, are there any events or experiences that have led you to this path of helping people unlock their brain potential? Because you've got such a unique and dynamic history of running different businesses as well. Well, it's interesting that you uh, start off with Montreal because it was um, the source of some of my greatest pain as well as some of my greatest breakthroughs. And so let me explain. When I was six years old, uh, my parents were, uh, we were living in Israel, in Tel Aviv, and um, my parents um, uh, met on a kibbutz in, in Israel. My father was from Morocco, Casablanca. My mother was from Romania. And when the Russians were invading Romania at 12 years old, she left and went to Israel as a 12-year-old by herself with her little eight-year-old sister. So she was in a detention camp in Cyprus for two years and then got to Israel at 14, met my father at 16. They got married at 18. Now, the reason I start off with that is um, uh, they had my brother, then my sister, then me. And back then, Israel was, you know, involved in a lot of wars with its, uh, you know, Arab countries. And so I grew up in war-torn Israel, and they were tired of, um, of raising their three children in, uh, in that type of environment. So they moved to Montreal, and the reason they moved to Montreal is because my father spoke French. So that was a natural place to go, you know, to, uh, you know, another part of the world where at least he could start all over. And... It was great that he started all over and he started off as, he was a cab driver and my mother worked as a seamstress. Uh, but I went into grade one not knowing the language and not knowing anything. And they were t- teaching in English and French. And so I quickly fell behind in, in the languages uh, and in everything because I didn't understand. And there were 50, 60 kids per classroom because Montreal back then was a hub for immigrants. And mm. the schools, the public school system was packed with kids. I mean, every classroom was, you know, kid, 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 rows of kids. Um, And um, over the first two years, I just felt really stupid. I felt like I wasn't smart enough. I didn't understand the language. I didn't make a lot of friends. And um, I started getting in trouble by, you know, just being obnoxious in class and bouncing around. And, um, you know, they thought I had ADHD and maybe I did, but I was just bored shitless looking at the ceiling for most of the days. (laughs) And um, that quickly turned into me just getting into trouble and then me being in the principal's office and me hanging around with kids who were also getting in trouble because they were experiencing the same thing. And then what was even more frustrating is when I went home, um, my parents couldn't help me because they were learning the language too. And Mm. uh, they already spoke French between them. So they didn't really want to learn English initially. So needless to say, between the age of you know, six and 13, uh, my prominent school years, I just fell behind. And then between 13 and 17, uh, I got into a lot of trouble uh, with uh, breaking in entries, with selling drugs, with skipping school, with uh, being in detention centers and getting into a lot of trouble. So that was the the tough time in my life. Uh, And then I had a breakthrough. Uh, And uh, towards my, you know, 18th birthday, when the things that I was doing uh, could get me into a lot more trouble. So it, it went from detention centers to now, you know, jail. 
right. so that was the the path that I was heading on was either the morgue or jail. Uh, and the reason I know this is because some of the friends I was hanging with uh, went to jail. Uh, one died uh, as a result of uh, getting into an altercation on a drug deal. And so that was my potential future. And my brother, who uh, I was very close with, who used to play on the professional tennis circuit, uh, had met this man in Toronto, Canada, where he ended up um, working. And uh, this man was a very successful entrepreneur that really just cared about his family and people in the, in the community. And my brother arranged for a lunch date for my brother and I and him. Now, I was in Montreal, 350 miles away from Toronto. And so my brother says, you know, take the train because I didn't have a car. I was still living at home with my parents. And so I took the train, you know, six o'clock in the morning. My father, who's a cab driver, dropped me off before he went to work. I took the train to see my brother. He picked me up at, you know, uh, 10 o'clock, whatever, 11 o'clock, went to lunch with Mr. Alan Brown. And he started digging into um, my life, my history, my past, my parents, uh, school, uh, you know, what I believe, what I wanted. And he asked me a couple of things that. I think, you know, this is really what I want to share with your audience. And um, he asked me, what were my goals? And I said, what, what do you mean? He says, well, what, what do you want to achieve? I said, well, I'd like to get a job. <laughs> I'd like to buy a car. I'd like to move out of my parents' house. And uh, I'd like a little bit of money so I can party with my friends on the weekends. <laughs> he says, that's great. Um, but what else do you want to achieve in your life? And I had never, ever thought of that question. Up until that point, I was 19 years old. And um, he said, well, let me show you something. And he, he pulled out from his briefcase this, these pieces of paper. And just to put into perspective, because I know most of your audience is going to be younger than, than I am. I'm 59 now. But just to put into perspective, it was the 1980s goal setting guide. Wow. And so he gave me this document and I opened up the first page. And he said, I'd like you to go sit in the table next to us here. I just fell out, you know, some of the questions. And the first question was, uh, at what age do you want to retire? I'm 19. <laughs> I want to retire. <laughs> I don't want to retire. I want to get a job. <laughs> I forgot to retire. Second question, how much net worth do you want to have? And so I looked at him. I said, Mr. Brown, uh, what's net worth? <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea what net worth was. Uh, third question, what kind of lifestyle do you want? Fourth question, what kind of car do you want? What kind of house do you want? You know, he, all these questions about what did I want, imagination type stuff. And so I started filling out all this stuff. I put, I want to retire at age 45. I want to have $3 million net worth. Um, I want to travel around the world, you know, first class. Uh, I want to have a Mercedes. I want to have a nice four bedroom house, blah, 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 blah. And he looked at this document and uh, he says, these are some really, you know, good ideas. You want to help your parents retire now that, you know, you're getting into the workforce. And he said to me, I'm going to ask you a question that will determine whether you achieve every one of those things. And at the back of my mind, I'm going, what one question is going to determine whether I achieve those things or not? And he looks at me and he says, are you interested in achieving those things or are you committed and so i'm like what interested committed i said mr brown what's the difference and he said i remember him saying son he says if you're interested you'll do what's easy and convenient if you're interested you'll keep using the story of you know coming from israel not knowing the language falling behind in school not being as smart as the other kids uh, you'll keep using all the stories, reasons, and excuses that you have for fucking up your life. It says, but if you're committed, you will do whatever it takes. You'll let go of the stories. You'll let go of the excuses. You'll upgrade your knowledge. You'll upgrade your skills. And you'll upgrade your identity to the type of man that can achieve every one of those goals and dreams. And by the way, he said, every one of those goals is achievable. He said, so... Are you interested or are you committed? And my head was spinning, right? No kidding. And so I cut out of my mouth. I don't know why. I just blurted out, oh, I'm committed. And he reached out his hand. He said, in that case, I will mentor you. And I said, wow, I mean, that's great. Uh, what's a mentor? <laughs> 
And he went on to explain to me that, you know, every successful person has a coach, whether it's a musician, an athlete, an entrepreneur, has a coach, somebody to show them what to do, what not to do, somebody to call them on their stuff. And I said, awesome. Um, uh, Thank you. Uh, How does it work? He says, well, since you live in Montreal and I live here, I need you to move from Montreal to Toronto. I go, what do you mean move from Montreal to Toronto? I don't have a job here. I don't have a car. I don't have any money. I don't have anything I could do here. He says, stop. You're already giving me excuses. I said, I know, but it's true. All those things. He says, stop. Everybody who's stuck thinks that their reasons, stories, and excuses are true. Mm -hmm. He says, first you make the commitment, then you figure out how. And so in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, oh, my God, what am, what am I getting myself into? And so I said, fine, fine, I'll move to Toronto. He says, great. He says, the second thing I want you to do is on May the 5th, there is a real estate course that's starting. It's five weeks, nine to five every day. Take the course, pass the test. I'll give you a job in my company. I said, a real estate course. I failed English. I failed math. I hate school. They kicked me out so many times. I'm embarrassed to go. He said, stop. Here you go again. You're telling me about your past and why you can't. When you're committed, you find out how you will because you must. I go, Mr. Brown, I, I'm really just not that good in school. You want me to learn about real estate? I don't know anything about real estate. My parents don't even own a home. Hmm. He goes, John, look how fast you go back to allowing your self-image and your past to control you. I said, I, I get that, but, he says, there are no buts when you're committed. You do whatever it takes. And so I said, fine, fine, I'll, 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 I'll move to Toronto. Uh, even though I don't know, you know where I'm gonna live, I don't have any money, I'll join this real estate school. He says, yes, and it's $500. I go, 500 bucks, <laughs> I have $40 in the bank. How old were you at this time? 19. 19, wow. 19, and he's putting, and this is all in like a 20 minute period of time. Yeah. He's just, he's just chiseling away at me and putting pressure on me to level up my thinking and to get a hold of my awareness of the self-talk that was going. And so, you know, I said, I only have $40. He said, great, figure it out. So my brother was sitting there. He says, well, Johnny, I can give you a hundred bucks. He said, maybe your sister can lend somebody. Maybe dad and mom can lend you some money. So short, lo- long story short for the, the purpose of the podcast, um, I moved to Toronto, Canada on May the 5th, 1980. I got enrolled into the real estate school. On June 20th, 1980, I graduated. On June 21st, I started working for him on commission only. And then he started to teach me business skills. Mm. That first 12 months, I made $30,000, which was $5,000 more than my father. And I was 20 years old. So that was the beginning of, you know, Montreal story of very challenging times, created this pressure to take advantage of this opportunity that kicked off my life and my career. Sure. And what do you think Mr. Brown saw in you specifically that made him so invested in helping you with your career and helping you develop the mindset you needed to get to this level? I think think he saw in me, you know, the same thing I see in every human being, Uh, you know, incredible potential. And, you know, I think everybody would agree if, if they've done any research into the human brain, right? Scientists can't figure out exactly how it works. Uh, it is the most powerful biocomputer organism in the whole universe. And, you know, he saw unlimited potential. He saw with, you know, focus and direction and upgrading skills and behavior and habits that he could help me. And... You know, I remember, you know, he, he shared, shared something with me that I haven't shared very often. Uh, every once in a while, I remember to share it. But um, in the first six months of, you know, him being my mentor and, and showing me what to do, why to do it, how to do it, when to do it, and um, identifying the landmines for me, whether it was the mental or emotional or strategical landmines, he said to me, he says, one day, he says, you know, I want you to promise me that you will teach others You know, once you've become successful, uh, pay it forward, teach others, you know, the potential that they have within them. And he was, you know, he was one of the old, old guys uh, uh, back then around think and grow rich, 
right? A lot of very successful people back in the day, you know, in the in the 70s and 80s were into the think and grow rich movement. And in Napoleon Hill's masterful book, which is one of the first books he had me read, you know, it says, you will become what you think about most. That was like the underlying theme. And I remember, um, you know, I told Mr. Trump, he said to me, well, you know, what did you learn from the book? He said, well, you become what you think about most. And I told Mr. Brown, you know, at 20 years old, I think I'm going to become a woman. And he chuckled and laughed back then because at 20 year old, I was thinking a lot about women back then. Sure. So he chuckled. But the, the whole idea was, you know, the, uh, the mental focus creates the emotional uh, um, uh, triggers that drives behavior. So uh, not only did he get me, you know, to write my goals initially at that lunch, he had me refine them over the next six months. So I had goals for health and wealth and relationship and career and business and money and investment. And then he said, now, how are you going to do this? What's the plan? Mm. And I go, well, what do you mean? What's the plan? He says, well, you just can't have a goal without a plan. You know, that's like saying I want to put a person on the moon, but you don't plan how you're going to do that. Uh, and then he said, you know, what do you need to believe in order to make that a reality? And like, what do you need to believe? Uh, I need to believe that it's possible. Um, I need to believe that I'm smart enough. Uh, I need to believe that I am good enough. I need to, you know, he made me write out my beliefs. And then he took it one step further. And he said, it's not enough to have vision and goals and beliefs. You have to take that vision and goals and beliefs and you have to get that into your subconscious mind so that becomes part of how you think and feel and behave every day. Sure. And so every day, you know, I sat down and I had my, you know, my goals document, right? I would read it every morning when I came into the office. I would run my fingers across it. I would close my eyes and visualize it and, and pretend like a Hollywood actor or actress that I was living that. And even though it seemed silly, stupid at first, you know, visualize something that's not real, feel something that's not true. Um, he didn't know it then, but the reason I went deep into the science and understanding of it is um, he was actually helping me create neural patterns, uh, new grooves in my brain, new networks and circuits that um, we now know are uh, part of neuroplasticity and um, and neural networks that go from conscious effort to subconscious automaticity. And even yeah. today, like I have my uh, my exceptional life blueprint, which is my entire goals document for wow. for my vision boards are here of stuff that I either achieved or I'm achieving my core prayer, uh, the story of my life, my results, my big why. Uh, my outer mission, my inner mission for what I do, my values, my top goals for health, wealth, relationships, career, business, everything right here. And you and review that on a daily basis. Every day I'm wiring that image. I record it onto my uh, iPhone and then yeah. I listen to it while I read it. Uh, and so I've been doing this for 40 years now. People ask me, why do you still do it? Uh, because it works. Like mm. why do athletes keep practicing you know why do musicians you know keep playing and practicing you know why does a rubik's cube expert keep doing it because because you're reinforcing patterns and the patterns that you reinforce are the ones that become automatic yeah and the ones that become automatic are your habits and your habits are what drive your behaviors and so uh, i've taken a very deliberate approach to goal achievement versus goal setting yeah, it's a great point because I think naturally our, our, our automatic brain is wired for fear in many ways. Just looking back in, you know, kind of our tribal days, our brains are wired to look for danger and it's not naturally wired for abundance and positivity. It's usually for survival that our brain has been able to keep us alive for, for this long. So if we yeah. don't natural, if we don't figure out a way to, uh, you know, consciously take control of their our brains, right. I imagine it's naturally going to go back into that mode. Is that part of the reason why the yeah. idea of inner size is so important? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know how much you can see behind me, uh, but you can see that I have Einstein over here. Yeah, you got Einstein uh, here as well. 
right? <laughs> and I've got Frankenstein's monster over there. Mm. And, uh, and I use that as teaching points in my book, Inner Size, but also to help people understand that the brain has got a hierarchy of the circuits that fire, right? And activate electricity and neurochemicals. So number one, you're 100% right. That is the survival of the human, right? And so that means that Frankenstein's brain, that amygdala part of our brain, is on very, very high alert 24-7 to determine whether there's something that is in our external environment. But even if it's something that we're thinking about, like jumping out of a plane, you know, if we think about jumping out of a plane, some people just go into, oh, no, no, no way, because their survival instinct kicks in. And uh, that's the number one priority of our brain. The number two priority is to avoid any pain or discomfort, whether it's real pain or imagined pain. So let's say I set a goal to um, uh, find a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Um, but in the back of our mind somewhere, either we've experienced pain or discomfort in being in a relationship or being rejected or being embarrassed or ashamed uh, or our friends have or our family has, in the very next second that we make a decision that we want one, our brain is going to check and balance against any real or imagined pain or discomfort or danger. And in the event that, the, you know, that we don't have emotional control, it then will cause us to behave in certain ways. Now, our brain is doing number one and two, um, while number three is active as well, and that is conservation of energy. Right? So... Our brain is trying to be as efficient as possible in case it needs to use energy for survival. Mm. So it's, a, it's an energy preservation uh, organism. And then number four on our brain's list of important things to activate circuits for, that is our desire to achieve joy, happiness, love, achieve our goals, uh, and, and have pleasure. So... If one, two, and three are overriding four, we won't take inspired action to make number four possible. So simply by understanding that these biological and neurological circuits are turning on or off and releasing neurochemicals, you know, either stress neurochemicals, you know, um, uh, which are usually the put your foot on the brake uh, neurochemical or take off and run, you yeah. know, or... Uh, and that's our fight or flight uh, nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system. Um, or uh, we're in this calm, responsive state, which is our parasympathetic nervous system. So we have these systems, we have these circuits, and most people are victims of their nervous system or circuits because they haven't learned some of the fundamental tools, the skills necessary to recognize uh, and be aware of the neural activity that's going on and the uh, feelings that they produce. And then they don't know how to release the disempowering ones and reinforce the powerful ones that cause you to take action. So this is a skill set issue where you haven't been trained to be mindful. You haven't been trained to deactivate stress and activate your respond uh, system. And you haven't learned those skills to reinforce them so that when times are really challenging, uh, you actually will not revert back to your old conditioning, uh, which is, you know, fight, flight, or freeze. Sure. Well, what are those skills? Let's, uh, maybe we can break these down. Sure. So the, um, probably the greatest skill that we could have as a human is awareness. So in my book, Inner Size, uh, I teach a couple of uh, about 25 different inner sizes. And the first inner size um, is to first and foremost uh, create uh, uh, hemisphere coherence between left brain and right brain, uh, but also to deactivate the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight flight system. And we can achieve that very, very easily. It's not something most people do deliberately, but they do it every second of every day. And it's called breathing. So when you and I take six deep breaths, for example, a deep breath in very, 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 very slowly through your nose, and then out very, very slowly through your mouth as if you're breathing out through a straw. Yeah. 
And as you breathe in, breathe in calmness and certainty and confidence. And as you breathe out, breathe out fear, worry, anxiety, and stress. Breathe in confidence and certainty and calmness. And I breathe out worry, anxiety, uncertainty, and stress. Feel better already. Yeah, six <laughs> breaths. Six breaths. We can actually see in an fMRI uh, mm-hmm. functional magnetic resonance image of our human brain. We can actually see the brain calming down and blood flow moving away from the stress centers into the calm centers. So blood flow, energy flows to where attention goes. So if our attention is in releasing through words, um, whatever we want to release, we're actually releasing the neurochemical associated with what we're saying. And we're breathing in what we want. We're actually releasing the neurochemical of the words that we are saying. That's how fast that uh, neuroelectrical system works. So if I get myself into a calm, relaxed state first, I deactivate stress, activate my calm and response system. Now I've got Einstein brain back online. I've calmed down Frankenstein brain. That's inner size number one. Why was now, it six? Just sorry to cut you off, Jim, but why was it six breaths? Just because it takes about a minute, and that's what we can see in the brain scan imaging. A minute gotcha. to a minute and a half is what it takes to deactivate that stress uh, fight flight system. Gotcha. Um, and the reason you breathe out through your mouth is because it causes you to hyper focus on the airflow here and not on anything else. Gotcha. So it's it's a focus, uh, it's a focused attention inner size. Uh, then inner size number two, and the key with this inner size is that you do it without judgment, blame, shame, guilt, or justification. Let me repeat. Inner size number two, it's called AIA, A-I-A, and you have to do it without judgment, blame, shame, guilt, or justification. Here is the inner size. In a calm, relaxed state, either take a sheet of paper or do this as a mental inner size. A stands for awareness. In this calm state, I want you to be aware of the last 20 or 30 minutes aware of the thoughts, the feelings, the sensations, and the behaviors that you've been engaged in without judgment, blame, shame, guilt, or justification. In this state of awareness, there's a question. Are these thoughts, emotions, feelings, sensations, and behaviors moving me towards the goals and dreams that I want or keeping me stuck or away? Just awareness. So once you have the answer, again, no judgment, blame, shame, guilt, or just case. So we're looking at patterns. All we want to see is observe my pattern. And then we ask, okay, what's my intention for the next 15 to 30 minutes? So my intention, be positive, uh, be focused, complete this task, move forward on this. That's my intention. Great. Now I've activated the Einstein part of my brain, I've activated the dopamine system in my brain, the reward center of the brain, I've activated the reward center uh, that's connected to the motor cortex part of my brain. Now I can say, what's one action step? What's one thing I could do right now to move one step towards the goal that I have for my business, for my relationship, for my career, for whatever? And so what happens if I do this once per hour during the day at 55 minutes past the hour. So every day at, you know, 7.55, 8.55, 9.55, 10.55, all the way through till the end of the day, I have a two or three minute inner size session to strengthen my awareness, to strengthen my uh, focus, to strengthen my activity that's positive towards what I want instead of being stuck or moving away from it. What do you think happens after one week of doing that by putting a little alarm on your cell phone to just beep, beep, beep at the 55 minute mark after the hour? Well, what happens is now you are consciously teaching your brain that you want to be aware. You're consciously interrupting disempowering patterns without 
judgment, blame, shame, guilt, or justification, and now you are deliberately evolving yourself and creating a new neural pattern that over the course of 30, 60, 90 days becomes an automatic pattern. Now your brain already does it automatically for you to catch yourself you know, with the disempowering, negative, or destructive thoughts to reinforce positive, empowering, constructive habits and thoughts. So now, who's in control? Oh, now yeah. you stop being you know, part of your automatic self, and now you have deliberately interrupted patterns that may not be serving you, and now you deliberately are creating and reinforcing neural network, neural pattern circuits that fire automatically every single hour to keep you on track. That's a high performance individual. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, so instead of allocating like a specific part in the morning or in the, in the evening, the idea is to have this on an intermittent basis so that you're, you're, you're never putting your brain in this uh, negative mode. You're always, every hour, always trying to always get your brain firing. Balancing. Always checking, balancing, so you readjust. I mean, think about a, uh, you know, an airplane. You get onto an airplane, what does the pilot do, right? She puts the coordinates of you know where she wants the plane to land mm -hmm. right and then the plane takes off and it's off course you know every second because of the headwinds the tailwinds uh the weather the pressure etc and the autopilot just keeps adjusting keeps adjusting keeps adjusting keeps adjusting sure. keeps adjusting a guidance missile system works the exact same way an autopilot works the exact same way and our brain can be trained to recreate its own pathways and grooves so that it keeps readjusting and keeps reactivating that left prefrontal cortex, which is the Einstein part of your brain, which is like your GPS part of your brain that can calibrate, recalibrate, calibrate, recalibrate. And the better you get at that, the easier achieving your goals becomes. I love it. And now how can we use this tool or skill to help people shift their mindset around money? A lot of people have this limiting belief about money, partially because they just didn't grow up with a lot of money. I didn't grow up with a lot of money. I know people struggle with this to think bigger. How can we use this tool that you're talking about with inner size to help people shift their mindset to, to think bigger around their financial health? Yeah. So, um, I, um, I have a, a few programs that my students use. One of them is called seven days to a millionaire mindset. The other one's called winning the game of money. But before that, uh, let me ask you a question um, just so we can set a foundation for money. Like, what is money? For me, it's a tool. Okay, so it's a tool for what? For me, it's a tool to, it's a currency really, I guess, in, in the capitalistic world that we live in to be able to provide to be able to buy things that I need and in in essence to be able to help others that are also in need. Yeah. So you're hundred percent right. It's a, it's a tool. It's a, uh, it's a means of exchange, right? If we go back to the time before money, uh, right? Tribes lived, you know, together and somebody went fishing and somebody went to gather some seeds or nuts or, you know, uh, fruits or, or, or whatever the case is, and everybody ate. And then when tribes, you know, separated, uh, one tribe was really good at carving stuff, and another tribe was really good at fishing, another tribe was really good at growing, you know, grains or vegetables. And then they, they said, I'll give you three of these uh, vegetables for one of those fish and six of those arrows, uh, and one of these, you know, saber tooth tiger slaying devices. And so we created this system of exchange. So the first question is this. Uh, if money is a means of exchange, is there more than enough of it on this little blue planet Earth? Yeah. Okay, so there's like more than enough, right? There's mm -hmm. more enough jewels, gold, money, coins. Uh, we used to change chocolate, uh, chocolates, livestock, seashells. Those are means of exchange that tribes and, and people shared with each other. Then we had Absolutely. coins, then, then paper, then electronic means, and everything had this value system. All right, so what if making money was as simple, of, as simple as asking yourself, what value do I bring to the marketplace and how much is that value worth? And then how can I increase my value in the marketplace so that I, my product, my service, my skill, my knowledge is worthy of requesting more money? 
So that's part of the equation. The other part of the equation is why do some people earn $10,000 a year and other people earn $10,000 an hour? Value, I guess, of what the well, marketplace is willing to pay. Right. So part one is value, but the other part is self-worth and self-image. I see. Right. Yeah. So we can have two people with the same skill set, same product, same service. One will charge $500 for it. One feels like $50 is too much. Mm. Right. So when it comes to monetization, um, what we charge and what we bring to the marketplace, uh, a lot of times is determined by what we feel the value that we bring is. And if our self image and our own money story, we call it, is scarcity minded, then we will not feel that what we bring is valuable. So in addition to the understanding of the law of compensation, I call it, we have to understand the law of self-image and our money story. So if we can change our beliefs around what we are worth, if we can change our own money story and the value that we can bring, and we understand the law of compensation, now we have a phenomenal methodology for doubling, tripling, quintupling income. And here's, here's proof of that. And for everybody who's watching or listening, ask yourself a question. Do you know of something you could be doing right now to make more money? What could you be doing better, faster, uh, or do you know of somebody that you can ask for help if you really want to double your income in the next 12 months? And almost everybody says, yeah, I know something I could be doing. So then the question is, why aren't you doing it? Like, why aren't you doing the thing that you know you could be or should be doing? And the answer is either you have limiting beliefs holding you back, you have fear holding you back, or you have self-image holding you back. It's not about the how, because the how you can Google in five minutes or less and either buy the book, buy the course, buy the program, get the coach, get the expert to help you with all the how. All the how to, unless you're trying to colonize Mars, we already know. Yeah. So the how is not your problem. And it has to be one of those three things. And that's really why I started my company, you know, my neuro gym. Um, and, and that is to give people the, the, the tools to uh, really work on the inner game so that they can achieve the outer game that they want. The inner yeah. game determines the outer game. And I, if John, I feel like what you touched on is, is so critical because we use money as a analogy and, and money is something we can measure, something we can quantify, but we're yeah. all investors, whether it's investors of money in terms of the physical currency itself, but it's also around our time. And I think the limiting belief of people of not being able to value their time, it can translate to certainly how much they make because of how much they can charge per hour, but it's That's also right. around how they allow people uh, into their lives or how they allocate their own time. And if right. someone actually values their time at $10,000 an hour versus $10 an hour, watching Netflix is not exactly, uh, you're, pretty, you're pretty much drowning your, your money out of the toilet, right? And you're not being productive with the time that you have. Uh, so I think what you touched on is, is so transferable to so many other aspects of our lives. Well, time is actually our, our greatest asset, right? And, um, uh, every day we're given 86,400 seconds. And at the end of the day, it's all spent. The question is, you know, was the investment worth it? Did you use that asset in a way that it gave you more or depleted you? Yeah. Right? Which one? Did you put more into the bank at the end of the day? And I'm not just talking about the financial bank, right? Uh, I'm talking about the mental bank, the emotional bank. You know, I'm talking about that side. Did you get a return on energy and a return on that investment of your life? Many years ago, um, I, I learned to ask a different question that most people ask. And, you know, the question that most people ask, or many people, maybe not most, is, you know, am I really worthy of those big goals and dreams do I have that I have? And I learned to ask the question a little bit differently. And the question was, are those goals and dreams worthy of me trading my life for them? Hmm. Now, if you value your life, 
you know, as Bruce Lee said, then you must value time because time is what life is made up of. And so if you don't value your life, you won't value time. If you don't value time, you'll squander it. Um, so I want people to just give that a thought right now, right? And so we, we've been, you know, challenging, challenging times, right? And there's a lot of people right now going, oh, my God, I wish I would have. I wish I could have. I wish I did when I could have. Uh, well, guess what? You know, the, the um, Chinese have a, a great saying says, you know, the best time to have planted a tree was 50 years ago. Uh, the very best next time is right now. So are you planting your seeds right now? Are you taking control of your mindset uh, and your emotions and your skill set? Are you planting the seeds right now that will give you the harvest in 90 days, 180 days? Or are you just going to keep repeating the same patterns and reinforce you know, the same seeds that bring you the same fruit year after year, month after month, quarter after quarter? Um, you know, uh, hope and prayer is, is good, but it's not, shouldn't be your ultimate strategy. Yeah. I love it. Right? Well, that's, to close, a, that's what I call the drug of choice. Hopium. Hope. <laughs> I love it. Well, John, I, uh, I want to, I want to close up, but I want to, I want to talk to you a little bit about the future of neuroscience. You know, we're going through, you know, obviously the election right now, but we're also going through a very fundamental shift in the economy. We had Andrew Yang on who obviously ran through the UBI program and yeah. his, he was advocating this because most people are going to be losing their jobs due to automation, starting with truck drivers all the way to regular bookkeepers. Um, it's going to be a very lumpy period of retraining. And I agree, like the first step would be to help reprogram the mind, the mind which is what, what you're doing is so valuable. And do you see anything in the in the horizon of neuroscience that, can fundamentally change how we learn? Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, the, um, there is um, uh, the next explosion of innovation is happening right now. So innovation in health, innovation in jobs, innovation in AI, robotics, uh, biochemical, uh, every single area uh, in our society is going through a massive change right now. We will see more change in the next 10 years, as we saw in the agricultural and industrial revolution, uh, and even the, um, you know, the computerization of the world. And so we are gonna see more change in the next 10, 15, 20 years than we've seen in the last 150 years. So that's part one, yes. Uh, part two, uh, the only, uh, well, I shouldn't say the only, but uh, the only human that likes change is a wet baby. Uh, the rest of us resist it. Why? I'm going to go back to uh, the second uh, part of the brain, you know, that fires off is any time that our brain seeks change, uh, there's risk. And we like predictability. So our brain is consistently predicting the next minute, the next hour, the next week, the next day. And innovation and massive change creates a lot of unpredictability. And that sets off the fear centers in the brain, the anxiety, stress centers of the brain. And people don't have the skills to deal with these emotions and feelings. We're not taught that emotions are triggered in your subconscious mind. They trigger off these neurochemicals that causes us to feel certain things. So that's the, 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 uh, the, the uh, um, system at work. Now, What's going to change now is because of artificial intelligence, because of innovation, because of a customization of having a watch on that's connected to your heartbeat, your heart rate variability, connected to your brain and the electrodes and the electrical activity in your brain, uh, we'll be able to recognize, reframe, release and retrain our brains much faster than ever before, whether it's through a little pulsation on our watch a little beep on our monitor or computer screen. Uh, we'll be able to go into AR, VR, and mixed reality for better training. We'll be able to connect uh, you know, to all of the systems that we can learn how to regulate better, faster, and easier than ever before. Uh, that's why Elon Musk is working on Neuralink. That's why uh, so much money is going into the neuroscience field. Now, all of this is going to come um, at a pretty interesting cost, in my opinion. And that is, uh, there's going to be a group of people 
uh, like always, they're going to be the early adopters, you mm -hmm. know, and they're going to just go, let's go. We see where this is going. Uh, we're going to do it faster, better, easier. There's going to be an enormous amount of people that will resist the change. And, you know, Eric Hoffer many years ago said, in times of change, the learners will inherit the earth as the learn the learned um, will live in a world that no longer exists. So what happens is it creates this gap, this bigger chasm between the have and the have nots, because the average person is not trained to be comfortable with change. And uh, a few years ago, I was in the Galapagos Island. I came back with one of my favorite hats and it says, adapt or become extinct. Mm. And nature doesn't think twice about inflicting capital punishment. Like we are, we are in nature. Right. And so nature doesn't think twice about inflicting capital punishment. And one of the laws that we all know is survival of the fittest, but it's also survival of the smartest and survival of the ones most willing to adapt and change. So there's going to be this really messy, ugly period, I think, uh, followed by, you know, uh, uh, more uh, adoption. And we, we know what those adoption curves look like. So there's this goopy metamorphosis stage that, you know, uh, every caterpillar that wants to become a butterfly goes through the chrysalis, right? Sure. Uh, so that's that's we're just entering into this massive innovators innovation uh, stage in our history. Gotcha. Well, we may not have all the solutions today, but to bring this to full circle, John, what is one small but actionable step that the listeners can take to do after this uh, episode that can help them make be more adaptable, that can help them shift their limiting beliefs? Anything that you think that they can do today? Um, if I can give a shameless plug, I'd highly recommend pick up Inner Size on Amazon. Uh, and it'll give you a lot of tools. And I also have nine brain training audios that give people away for free to do the inner sizes that are in the book. Uh, so I'd recommend they do that. Um, but the one thing that I, that I really think is, is, is helpful is if you take a few minutes at the beginning of the day and a few minutes at the end of the day, like five. At the beginning of the day, you know, uh, in addition to doing what I'm grateful for and, and starting off with gratitude, uh, set your intention for the day of here's what I'd like to feel, here's what I'd like to think, and here's what I'd like to do and accomplish today. Uh, and then at the end of the day, ask yourself, was I able to manage doing that? Uh, and then what can I do for tomorrow? to just make progress. So if you set yourself on a course to make progress every day, um, if you do it for three or four or five minutes, you'll see some major improvements. If you start to do it for 10 or 15 or 20 minutes, you'll see even more improvement. And so take time to think and connect and feel and adjust the course a little bit each day. So don't be on autopilot all the time. You know, take time to think. Thinking is the highest order of a human being. And unfortunately, if most people said what they were thinking, they would be speechless. People have thoughts, but they're not thinking. What am I feeling? Why? What am I doing? Why? What can I do? Uh, why am I not taking action? What's holding me back? Why do I not want to go deeper to finding out why? So if we can just take a little bit of time to be self-reflective and as Ray Dalio, a brilliant hedge fund guy, says, you know, be radically honest. And in the radical honesty, you'll find the freedom and your path forward. Uh, that's a great practice every day. I love it, John. Great way to end. I'll link all those things below, guys. Make sure you guys go check out what John is up to with My New York Gym, his book, of course. Thank you so much, John, for coming on. Thank you guys for tuning in. And we'll see you guys next week. Thanks so much.